This is a d d d d Hello, everyone, and welcome to Deep Dive Zone, a Sonic the Hedgehog reread series for fans of all shapes and sizes. As usual, I'm your host, Devin, joined as always by my comrades, Lauren and Bruce, and today we are continuing our journey through Archie Sonic the Hedgehog. And uh, last time uh, we saw Robotnik uh, seemingly die. Quite a cliffhanger. Yeah, it was one hell of a cliffhanger, goddamn. Well, it would be, were it not for Sonic the Hedgehog at number 22. Granted, you know, we, we did mention, you know, there was a month between 21 and this, and they did not definitively state that Robotnik was back until this issue. I don't think it has to be lessened by the fact that it's obvious he'll come back. Uh, I yeah. still think it's a great, a great two stories. Yeah. Well... Anyway, we are starting this issue off with The Return, written by Kantorovich and Penders, and art by Patrick Spaziant. Robotnik is returned home by Robo-Robotnik, and inadvertently stops his own doomsday protocol that would destroy all of Mobius. He uses the rest of the day to gloat. So I, I kind of left out in that description. I wrote that way too long ago to know why I wrote it that way, but mm -hmm. we start off in uh, the future from Sonic in Your Face. I thought so. Yeah, a really strange way to start the story, I must say. Yeah. I think in context, it kind of makes sense, because if you end last issue by saying Robotnik is dead, and you start this issue years in the future with Sonic and Sally having won, so to speak, then you can kind of assume, like, oh, this is the, the, the future of this timeline, but it's not, and it is a different timeline, because Robo-Robotnik's here. Oh, you're just saying, for, for a second... It's kind of like another fake out. Okay, that's a, yeah, that's a good point. Yes, but, so I, I guess the, the question is, did Eve know that she was telling teleporting Robotnik across time and space? Why would the Disintegrator Beam do that? Yeah, I, something tells me Eve didn't think that's what was going to happen. So yeah, there's really no explanation at all as to how right. it works. It just um, happens. It was just a freak accident. I wish they right. had explained something, but... I would love some, you know, BS mumbo-jumbo. Uh, you know, the plot has to bend to this sort of yeah. thing. So, yeah. Well, and speaking of the plot being bent, Robo Robotnik, we had a huge discussion about this uh, last episode, or maybe the episode before that, when uh, he first showed up, because I the, the nature of Robo Robotnik in this story is really weird, because Ian Flynn, the, you know, much longer running writer for these comics later, would retcon right. that this Robo Robotnik and the one we fought before were different ones because they have totally different backstories. According right. to Penders, they're the same, but this one, this Robo Robotnik roboticized himself during the final battle with Sonic, who, I might add, does not appear to be a cyborg, um, right. and uploaded his consciousness to a satellite, which is where Robotnik ends up. After rereading re this, I don't know what Penders was going yeah, on about. I, they're I, so I, obviously different. It's so weird that he insists that they're the same character when they're clearly completely different universes. I, it's it's the fact that he wrote both stories that does it for me. Because if he were just using somebody else's character, then it would make sense I, that he just contradicts whatever they wrote. Because he does that all sure. the time. Um, sure. But in, yeah, no, in, instead, he's insisting it's the same universe even though clearly isn't, and he wrote both stories. So I, I think what it has to mean is that uh, within Penter's version of the canon, these versions of Sonic would have to have fought Robotnik, and then during their battle he roboticizes himself, and right. then he turns all of them into cyborgs, and then Night of a Thousand Sonics happens and he loses, right. and then they fight again in a thing that we never see, and that's between him being roboticized and uploading himself to the satellite, and then everybody uh. gets de-cyborgified to become the Sonic and Sally with kids here that we see at the start. Oh, fucking hell. There are so many leaps of logic there. Like, Robotnik was defeated. Robo Robotnik, that is. He was just ahead. Like, right. That doesn't make any sense how he could have possibly gotten himself back. And then, yeah, the whole robot well, you're a robot, you can get a new is body, nonsense. Dude. Yeah, but he, 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 but sure, was, if you have a, if you're a robot, but Robo Sonic took Robotnik's head. Yeah, uh, it wasn't how, just left alone. Yeah, yeah I don't how, know what he did with it. I don't know how what happened, what course of events must have taken place. Maybe Snively did something. The only thing that could have happened is that this is an alternate, this is another, this is a different Robo-Robotnik, clearly. 
despite the fact of that all being complete nonsense, the thing that really <laughs> does it for me, actually, uh, you might consider more minor, is the fact that when Robotnik and Robo Robotnik interact in this, it's actually a pretty pretty cool interaction because they it's almost cool. like bond about how they're both evil and yeah. how they can't give up even if they're like at their lowest of lows. They can always rise up again, and they're they're like totally friendly to each other, which doesn't make any sense if this is the same one. Robotnik should be furious at Robo Robotnik and vice versa uh, because they were head to head before. Yeah, I, hmm. Well, okay, I, I, I do agree with that, but I also like, see, it's fun seeing them kind of bonding over how evil they, they are. No, no, no. They inspire was, each other. Yeah. I was saying that like, is what makes me think this is a different role of Robotnik. Okay, oh, okay yes. gotcha. Given, no, that, 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 given yeah. that, this is fine, this is great, I love it. No, I agree with you. Yeah, with, with the theory, if we're all assuming that this is a different Robo Robotnik, cool, that's really cool. <laughs> That, yeah. That's fun seeing them bonding, but if it's uh, if it's the same robot Robo Robotnik, that's just dumb. Exactly. Yeah. We're not we, we we can't dwell on it. We gotta get through. The rest no, of this. We, we we can't just sit here and bitch about it. No, it's a yeah, good story. It's... Let's move on. Yeah, it is yeah. a good start. The rest of this story is uh, pretty good, actually. It's mostly you know the Freedom Fighters are trying to clean up. They're trying to retake things with no Robotnik here, uh, but Snively basically by complete accident. No, actually, literally by accident. He speaks a code phrase which activates a protocol for all of Robotropolis to go completely scorched Earth, which Robotnik planned to happen in the event of his death. This is, like, the raddest thing that I've it's seen pretty, in a while from this comic. Pretty, yeah. No, it's it's hardcore, and it's it makes sense as a very evil thing for Robotnik to do. It is totally perfect for him to do. Well, it's great, because usually he has, like, convoluted, like, plots that let him gloat a bit, but right. if he's hey, dead, he doesn't care about that anymore. He, All his, out. His plans are never to go full Scorched Earth and take everything out. Yeah, but, it's, it's really, if I can't have this planet, nobody can. can. Uh, it's, it's fun. I, I really it's like fun. that. It's cool. So you mentioned, you mentioned Sniffly triggers it, and I'd like to bring up the way Sniffly acts here. He's like... <laughs> depressed he's he throws, like he throws like a temper tantrum yeah he's like i i can't <laughs> believe that robotnik didn't tell me about how to run any of this stuff on my own like i'm completely helpless which leads to my theory which i don't remember if i mentioned last episode i really think snively has no maybe bits and ideas but he's nowhere close to his overthrow plan which no. spoilers will happen later yeah uh, you're but, right all right. no, he, at this point, he was not expecting, completely blindsided, and right. he's just he's just a regular dude stuck in the ruins of Robotropolis, basically. Right. And, uh, yeah, no, I, I just generally like uh, the story here, because they, they just have to scramble the moment that things start going wrong, and then they kind of need to rely on Robotnik to fix it for them. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. a really cool moment when Robotnik teleports in, and then he's like, oh, hey, Snively. What's going on? And then one of the his own swap bots attacks him because you're like, oh, this is a different sort of situation, isn't it? Yeah, and like he, you know, he's like, oh, you know, you triggered Operation Wasteland, you dumbass, and uh, you know, he he of course is not like sympathetic towards Snively or anything, but Snively is happy to have him back because he is completely directionless without him. And Robotnik's mm -hmm. like, oh, I see, I just got to stop all this, and so. He does, and it just leaves Sonic and the others, you know, the, the onus is shifted on them to be like, well, what the hell do we do now? And he's like, leave, go home, I'm tired. <laughs> so this makes me makes me wonder a little bit. Robotnik is like, oh, you, I had to save you guys. Uh, you have to thank me for, for getting out of this one. But the question is, like, is that really true, or is it just mind games? Or, Ooh. I mean, is it really possible to know, I suppose? Because like we said before, Robotnik never does go all out. So it's kind of a, an ambiguous ending. Like so much of the time they act like, oh, it's easy. Robotnik is, we're, 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 we're so cool and we can kick swap us all day long. But like, is this, is this like a bit of, a bit of reality in their face, if you will? 
Yeah, they they're, they're learning that it is, in fact, not a game, even though the person they're fighting against views it as a game. Right. Yeah, it's just... It's a very interesting note to end on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By contrast, something that is not that interesting is our second story for this issue, Tales Nighttime Story, written by DeCesare, art by Dave Monick. Sally tells Tales a bedtime story where he, Sonic, and Robotnik are knights in shining armor. It's another what-if story. Hey! Tone Whiplash, again. They do this It really is. It's, it's funny. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like I don't even like there's some there's always an okay moment in these, but it's like how do you how do you review a series of disconnected gags? Well yeah, my notes for this story are just some of the jokes I liked. Like there's not really any substance here to talk about. No, the most that you have is that Tails learns not to take Sonic's armor and pretend to be him when he can't do that. On honestly, uh, my only notes are uh, I kinda like Robotnik's armor. Like he yeah, kind of looks cool. Black Knight. Yeah. And also, he's sweating oil. <laughs> I like that Snively is there with Robotnik for one frame, and then <laughs> he, in the next one, he's like, "Whoa, I didn't make it into this panel." And he's just gone for the rest of the story. He is wearing some <laughs> fugly ass armor. He really is. Monik's art for Snively is kind of. He looks like a, a upside. He looks like a letter P. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he frankly, frankly Spazion's drawing of Snively in the in the earlier story also looks really weird. I think that it was hard for it a hard a design weird. for the artist to get. Well, Snively is like a vaguely strange design in the first place, but yeah, oh, he's no, just no. weird looking in general. Yeah, <laughs> but I, it's also it's weird whip uh, art whiplash going from Spazion's art to a Monix art. It feels like I've been teleported back in time by several issues. Yeah. <laughs> totally. It Why? reminds me of the uh, the other time travel story, actually. Oh, with, with Sonic the Bog Hog? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because uh, it feels like they're oh, doing okay. the same gag, too. Uh, kind of, yeah. Where the characters are, like, aware that they're in the past and make jokes about how things haven't been invented yet or whatever. You know, it would be kind of funny or kind of fun to have a time travel issue, but its gimmick is just that uh, one one point of time is drawn by one person and the other point is drawn by a different person. Oh my gosh. They I... have something kind of like that, where they have art drawn by okay. one person and then a different guy draws flashbacks, not a time travel story. But Okay, well that, that's the same idea. Yeah. How come Eggman was not the Black Knight in Sonic and the Black Knight? I'm just thinking about that now. Uh, is this a spoiler to ask who the Black Knight is? Because I haven't played Sonic and the Black Knight. Yeah. It's... He's completely generic. He, he's, he could oh, be nobody. Okay. Oh, okay. He's not, like, a big part of the story. Yeah, he there is, is no, there is no Eggman in that game. Huh. Anyway, that doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> let's get into issue 23 here. Um, with, uh, Sonic and, Egg and Robotnik in a bubble... But uh, the the story for this issue is Ivo Robotnik Freedom Fighter, written by DeCesare and art by Dave Monick. Sonic, Tails, Rotor, and Sally find themselves in a routine scrap with Robotnik and Snively when all six are suddenly abducted by the colossal alien Karim, who seeks to enclose them in his alien zoo. Robotnik is forced to work with the heroes to save his own skin. I'm gonna be honest, I don't think I have a single note for this story. I don't blame you. <laughs> um, I do have a few things to say, though, myself. Um, I don't get why the Freedom Fighters are like, oh, don't kill Robotnik, he's our friend. They value life? I don't know. They seem to push the whole, oh, good guys play fair uh, thing in this story a number of times, actually, because they save Karheem as well. Um, so... I, I feel like, given the chance, they would rather, like, try and rehabilitate Robotnik than just kill him. Rehabilitate him? Oh, what fools. I, I, I mean, I... That's, not, that's not realistic, but I, I assume See, that's what they would rather do. See, that makes sense in the modern comics, where Eggman has, like, a good guy persona, and Sonic, like, sees him for, you know, sort of the sad, confused old man he is. In this, he's too much of a bastard for that to make sense to me. You know, this guy, the comics Robotnik is 
way more brutal. Well, and he kind of, he kind of actually, you know, I was thinking that like, oh, sometimes he's silly, sometimes he's serious because different writers. But actually, it's more entertaining to think that Robotnik is like bipolar and he just flips between ridiculous and just like completely brutal. He's he's a man child. He has a, a very uh, a very kiddish demeanor, but also has a very adult jadedness. Mm. So, <laughs> God, I'm, I'm reading my own notes notes here that I took months ago, and I, I I see one that says this issue is an important landmark. It's the first time we see Sonic's feet in a comic. That Sonic is true. The comic with ants in his shoes, which that's yeah. also going to be weird later on when we get into Archimedes, but. <laughs> you know, um, it, it, all right. It's the worst spoiler. I I hate Archimedes. He sucks. Um, I agree, but still spoilers. But yeah, damn, you can't just drop that shit and then not want, not expect me to ask why he sucks. He he sucks for Pender's reasons. Um, oh, but God. anyway, uh, Eggman or Robotnik, that is to say, has a gun that can roboticize people with a single shot at the start here. Which, A, that's kind of like the thing from Adventures of Sonic and the time travel bit with Blackbot. And B, like, they should treat that with more weight than it has. Yeah, honestly. Yeah, it comes up and they kind of forget about it. It's well, weird. so something like that, it's, it's hard to balance something like that in a power scaling level. Yeah, power it's scaling. probably just, it's it's probably just best to forget that it existed. That. Honestly, yeah. Well, I know, you know, using power scaling related to this comic later on is just, is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, when when portable roboticization comes back, it's treated, I think, with its due right. weight. Uh, I, unless there's something I'm forgetting about. There's a thing here or there, but for the most part, you're right. For some reason, uh, Karim and his alien ship, the tube that he sucks people up with is called the Umbilicus, which is like, it just, it just leads to a weird metaphor of being in a spaceship as being pregnant, though. I, I don't like it. Honestly, it's, I saw, I, I saw the name and I didn't read it close enough to even notice that, so it doesn't bother me. Well, speaking of names, do you guys know the, the, the name thing with, with Karim here? Because I didn't notice it first. No? No. I can't, the I planet can't he's from is called Wheat with three E's, so his name is Karheem of Wheat. Oh. Oh. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, no, it's it's one of the least funny jokes in the whole thing. Yeah, Jesus, that is. They they launch Karheem into space, and uh, Rotor saves him and teaches him that locking up small creatures is bad. And then Rotor has to get rid of his ant farm. Yeah. Because it's, it's basically... Uh, unlawful containment yeah 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 they kind of just go from point a to point b and it's about what you would expect um i would say it's forgettable although i don't know definitively whether karheem shows up again we see his planet and his people again at one point but not the guy himself. okay are they all like That's giant pretty, robots pretty uh, I actually don't remember what they look like. It's really only for okay. one panel, but he mm. does. He is technically important. Okay, gotcha. Okay, see, I didn't know that, but I was smart enough to think he probably would show up again because that's how these comics roll. Right. I've. I've. I mean, it's the same thing I've said every time. You know, and and that's not even just like the any random thing from Sonic. They're like any random thing from an earlier issue. Well, that shit's important. In some way. Yeah. I like so, it. I don't no, hate no, it. I, I, I love it, actually. It's silly, but it also helps to keep a sense of a semi-continuity, so I, I don't hate it. It means I can't completely write off any story, because I never right. know what will come back. Right. You can't even you can't even write off the do-it-yourself comic, which we get to see the three winners of here. To be honest, uh, I, I should have read these. I didn't actually read them. Listen... Uh, the dialogue here seems exactly like the kind of thing Gallagher would write, which really proves oh. that literally anybody could do it. <laughs> or maybe it was, it, he actually was the one that wrote them. Well, no, I... the thing is Penders wrote it, but... <laughs> oh, okay. I'm impressed, actually, that, that they managed... That, that they, um, they, they made an, an effort to fit in the same style, because Comic 1 and Comic 3, at least, 
uh, I'm like, yeah, the dialogue's right on. Second place one, honestly, is kind of bland. But you know, you've got you've got the silly robot nicknames. One at one point, he's called Ruler of Roundness, and you've got like the references yeah, so. to other media with like, did Pinocchio have to go through this? I I, I like number uh, three the best just because they redrew the entire thing. It's yeah, kind of cute. Going to be another point, yeah. But ours are all, like our it. comics are also better. Have fun installing Jandu cucks. <laughs> well, yeah, because ours have ours are completely unhinged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's nothing really else to say about them other than you know they exist they yeah, followed yeah, no, through it's... yeah our uh final story well my second story for this issue is the vol ant tear written by de Cesare, art by monic why did you have to title it that way when tails loses one of sonic's power rings in robotropolis antoine goes on a dangerous mission to retrieve it while bunny follows desperately trying to maneuver him out of trouble so I love this story. I like um, this one. It's cute. Yeah, it's, it's fun. Like a perfect Antoine story, honestly. Cause, cause it's Antoine doing his best out of just dedication. He wants to help Tails, and right. even though he's not like especially competent, you know, he's trying his best. And Bunny is here to be awesome and uh, keep him out of trouble. Well, it's nice to. Work. It's also it's nice just to get to see more of Bunny. Yeah. Cause like yeah. We've barely seen any of her. It's a story and, about people who care about each other. It's yeah, well, about it's her. also it's appropriate because I do know that they end up together at the uh, at some point. Yeah, this is I guess the the first hint of any of that. Right. Also, yeah. I, I I like Bunny's design with uh, I. Is that supposed to be what she's sleeping in? I think it's a nightgown. I guess. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know what whatever it is. It's cute. I like it. Yeah, I like it. It's. It's fun. It's fun seeing Antoine going on his big adventure to help Tails and Bunny saving him or helping him, whatever. It's it's fun. What I really like uh, is a bit of subtlety at the end where uh, Antoine is like, "Thanks for helping me, Bunny," and Bunny is surprised to see that he realized that she was there the whole time, mm. which means that he was he's not as big as a fool as you might think because throughout the comic he's like doing really stupid things and just it seems like by dumb luck but it's actually bunny helping him right but and if you think about it that's actually calculated on his part because he knew she was there right i think it's a little weird in that context but i also i also kind of like it because it's like because you you either have the context of he knew and therefore it's weird that they didn't just work together but then there's also the context of he knew but was also trying to save face or, you know, they both were because they both wanted to help each other. Well, it was Bunny wanted to help Antoine without him realizing so that he right. could feel like he uh, did, you know, the mission on his own. Um, but at the same time, Antoine didn't want Bunny to know that he knew she was there so that she would feel good about that and feel like she was helping him. So it's just happenstance. And it's beautiful. Yeah, it's good. I uh I don't know if uh Angelo de Cesare ever writes another story that I like. Uh but this one is good. It's also just very amusing in lots of parts. Antoine is just great. There I love the bit where he's like uh in the street and he's got a manhole cover on his head trying to read like a map. He's like, How can I concentrate with all this noise as a car like almost runs him over? And the giant steel beam just lands behind him and doesn't even see it. Yeah. Uh, I've also got a great Robotnik line in this one uh, where he says, I interrupted a pleasant nightmare to personally catch this intruder. I like the idea that Robotnik enjoys having bad dreams. It's wonderful. So yeah, all around. I love it. Good time. All right. Sonic number 24. We've got more evil doppelgangers. Oh boy! <laughs> so this, yeah, this is the first story that I saw Evil Sonic in. Mm. Why does why does why does Bad Guy Tails have like five o'clock shadow or something? It's the only way to make Tails look mean. Other than that, he just looks like a baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the story for this one is called "When Hedgehogs Collide." Uh, written by Kantarevich and Penders, art by Monarch. Sonic and the Freedom Fighters are shown 
terrorizing innocent animals, only for it to be revealed that it's actually the anti-freedom fighters invading from the evil zone. So Sonic and the regular freedom fighters have to uh, band together and stop them. Uh, the evil zone, isn't it? Uh, doesn't Evil Obis actually have a stupid name? Yes, uh, my girlfriend told me this. It's it, it's uh, if, well, she told me it's Mobius, but the O is replaced with an E, but it's still pronounced Mobius. It's it's Moebius, yeah. There we go. Okay, it's fucking, I... it's so fucking dumb. Well, that was a Flynn change. They they normally just call it anti Mobius until Flynn named it that, so it didn't even honestly, have a normal name until then. I'd rather have anti Mobius than dumb Moebius. <laughs> I, I don't know. Like it, I mean, Moebius is silly, but like, it's well, really Moebius stupid. is not how you say it. You still say Mobius, but they they did that so that they could be they could be said the same way because they're parallel versions of each other. Right. But they wanted to remove the anti connotation because they wanted to diversify that universe. Sure, and I, I get that, but like anti Mobius, I just like the idea that they called them, they called their planet. They're, 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 they're well, planet anti-Mobius, because that's, that's just funny. That's consistent with, with how P Penders writes them, is that they, they consider themselves True. the alternates. Yeah, <laughs> so, let's get into that a little bit. So, in the story itself, after we see just Havoc be uh, wreaked by them a little bit, and we see what started started off the conflict, it, it's, it's funny seeing a comic where parallel universe travel is so cheap, because Literally, Evil Sonic is just bored, and he's like, hey, let's just go wreak havoc in the good universe. I'm weirded out by, by Evil Sonic's, like, office that he's in. I don't know what exactly... Dave Monarch just loves to draw guys sitting at desks, I think. But, um, Evil <laughs> Sonic has a framed picture of himself looking, like, sad, and it just says My Hero on it. Thank you for bringing that up. I also noted that. Um... <laughs> There's some implications there to be had, I think. If we if we if we're running with the idea that he is indeed like uh, upset and you know disillusioned with his place in the universe, maybe that's just how he looks when the camera's not on him. He just looks depressed. The whole way the universe is evil, Mobius, Mo Mobius is set up um, <laughs> is bizarre because it's like somehow there are SWAT bots and Robotropolis, but. The, the freedom fighters that fight freedom uh, are in charge of that, and Robotnik is like a doctor or something. So, this is explained later, I hope. I don't really know. I don't know where Antoine got that eye patch. certainly. Um, Let's talk about Antoine for a second. Yeah, so he has two working eyes, but where's an eye patch? What's up with that? Okay, so I, I don't know if this is actually, like, the actual explanation, but pirates would do that, supposedly, for to basically have night vision. Yeah, it would keep one eye adjusted to the dark. Right, the Mythbusters proved oh. that. So they would oh. just swap which eye has the eye patch on it, so, they'd, so it would, the other eye would be ready to potentially swap. I don't know if that's why Evil Antoine has one, but let's say it is. Well, uh, him having what? one work, having him having two working eyes is, uh, believe it or not, an important plot detail. So, right, oh, all right. Hey, okay, then, um, all right, cool. These these stories they run so deep. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, the the rest of this is basically just Sonic and the others. You know, they get back, they discover that you know everybody hates them. Like, they're just, I guess, testing interdimensional travel at the start. They have, like, a ghost yeah. machine, like in Danny Phantom, which is the second time that show has come up. And then they just get back and everybody's like, hey, you assholes, what are you doing? They were not testing interdimensional travel. They were... No, they literally know it's the Zone of Silence, otherwise known as the Void, where the king is. Right, that's, I, that's what they're trying to do. So they're, they're not just to testing find... it out, they're trying to rescue the king. Right, they're trying to get into the Zone of Silence to find the king. Who the hell told them that that was where he was? It's my next question. Um, this Even... comic is just like, oh, they know that already, that's not a plot twist. Wait, yeah, that's right. For some reason, I think I was thinking of um, Sad AM, and I just kind of took it at face value. Yeah, Ari's not in these comics. Huh. It's funny, given they try to explain a lot of things 
but not this thing apparently, which yeah. would need more explanation. Yeah, they yeah. sometimes um, try too hard to explain some things. Yeah. Well, um, and uh, it would probably have been better if they spent less time on that and more time on actually figuring out a better way for them to cr confront their anti-selves. Because the way that they choose to do it is to uh, dress up as racial stereotypes. Yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah. Mm. I... I'm not... I don't feel like it's exactly my place to critique this. Um... I I know you you can critique it perfectly fine. You as someone who understands that it's that it's wrong, you can still critique it. Well, um yeah, no, they, they well there's there's nothing to say. It's just this is a very stereotypical depiction of right. Romani people. Um Right. Yeah, oh yeah. And then, then they take the outfits off and we can just pretend it never happened, except for when yeah. other transgressions appear later in the comic. <laughs> I, I, although I I say that I don't know if I'd say that there's anything this overtly visually uh, egregious caricatured after this, but right. Anyway, uh, big dumb fight ensues. Yeah, and like uh, they're evenly matched, and then it's like they have to just switch instead of Sonic fighting Sonic, then Sonic fights Sally, and etc. And then that. And then, for some reason, yeah, then the regular Freedom Fighters, that they're able to win that way. Apparently, yeah. it's it's like Team Fortress 2, where each uh, each character class is a counter to another one. <laughs> oh, yeah, you just gotta match it up perfectly. Oh, it's it's Pokemon. It's type matchups. Or, yep, well, I suppose this is all just again. coming down to, like, Rock, Paper, Hedgehogs, but... Yeah. And then Sonic is like... I don't remember. He said something like, you know, guess you didn't succeed in whatever you were here for. And then Evil Sonic's like, uh, no, nah, I came just to, for a fight. Solidifying that he's just a troublemaker. He's got no big goals. He's just angry. Angry boy. Where's Bunny is yeah. my question. But she doesn't, it doesn't matter. She's not here. Uh, Bunny is probably actually, like, actually playing defense and doing what they're supposed to be doing. You know, covering for the rest of them or something. I don't know. He's doing yeah, a job. Bun Bunny's just in Robotropolis, just beating the shit out of Badniks. <laughs> yes, I, like I want a comic about that. Anyway, um, so yeah, it's it's kind of a whatever throwaway issue. It doesn't really matter much in the grand scheme of things. I mean, it's kind of fun to see all of the freedom fighters fight their anti freedom fighters. The fight is at least drawn by Mawini instead of Monarch, which means that it's uh, more polished art-wise, so... Yeah, I mean, it'd be better if it was drawn by, like, Spazion, but whatever. He'll I get his moment story. in the sun. I'm um, no. I'm no? Oh, believe me. I'm yeah. no. I think it's somewhat notable, because the, the other anti-freedom fighters only were shown up in, like, one frame before, and so we right. actually have to see them proper now. Uh, yeah. But you're right, it's not, like, a remarkable story. They really like their black leather. Yep, that's yeah. what they all are about. Yeah, it's 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 like that's that's the comic like visual shorthand for evil because it's like they couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> but in Sonic number twenty five, our first milestone issue, we get introduced to Sega's idea of an evil Sonic design. Oh yeah, uh -huh. this is a rad issue. This issue is great. I mean, it's it's all it's almost purely because of how it looks. Yeah. But this is this is the Spaziant I, I know is uh well we it got is, Metal Sonic, oh. which they call Mecha Sonic. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which okay. is a whole thing that we're not gonna bother with. Um but we could sit here is... talking about it for like a week. Yeah. Totally. But this is this is our Sonic CD adaptation of the comic, a rather late Sonic CD adaptation, I might add, because you can see like mm. Sega Saturn ads in the background at some points. Yeah, um, yeah, because this would have been this is what like ninety five or ninety six, uh, something like that. And so it's yeah, it's a little while. CD came out in ninety two or three, right? Uh, yeah, ninety. 
2. Same year as Sonic right. 2. Right, yeah. Um, but anyway, so we get we get the great cover <laughs> with Sonic versus Metal Sonic that's, that's you know, a, a homage to the Sonic cover. And yeah. then we get this awesome spread of just every single character uh, on the inner page. I, I, I love that. That's I, such... I, Perfect twenty fifth kind of special material. I, I wish the uh, credits weren't there, honestly, so I could take a screenshot and make it my phone background. Yeah, that would be good. I could uh, I could try to edit this. I could mess with the contact co- uh, the contrast levels and see if I could just pen over some of this. I don't know how good it would look. Yeah, I tried it. I'm not good enough. If anybody else wants to give it a shot, be my guest. A while back, I uh, tried to just remove some dialogue boxes from some Ron Lim art because I was making a shit post. Um, and it took me several hours, but um <laughs> Spaziant is a better artist, so maybe that would keep me motivated longer. I don't know. But uh the story here is Go Ahead, Mecha My Day, written by Gallagher, drawn by Spaziant. When Robotnik kidnaps his pen pal Amy Rose, Sonic must journey through strange worlds and face off against new robot counterpart Metal Sonic to save her. Yeah. I I love that the comics um, put their own little spin on the CD story. I like that Amy is introduced because she writes Sonic Grams, which is just hilarious <laughs> because they talk about Sonic Grams a lot yeah. in these comics. Yeah. We open on something that automatically pisses me off, which is that they're fitting Sonic's shoe with a camera to see what he's running from, and they make a joke how when he goes his absolute fastest, they can't see a thing. But no matter how fast he was going, if it's on his foot, they shouldn't be able to see anything. Yeah, that's true. Because if you put a camera on a regular person's foot and had them walk, that would immediately be blurred. Yeah. 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 Very high tech camera. Remember, this is from the same guy who invented a thermos. <laughs> it's got perfect image stabilization. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh so anyway. something I, I'd like to point out real quick. I this first page, I really like the art on it. And I think I've I've put I I I've kind of finally like figured out what I like about Spazian's art so much. His art feels like basically feels timeless it's like it doesn't feel dated yeah exactly this this looks like it could have been drawn a week ago whereas a lot of the other artists their art feels kind of dated yeah even even better ones like mawini it's still like yeah this is clearly a comic from like it's very 90s it's very 90s but spazion's art that looks like a comic from like last week yeah and indeed he does still draw stuff occasionally for idw i believe Oh, that's cool here. And he's just, he plays so close to the actual Sega um, designs yes. for the characters. Yes, yes, uh, this drawing of Sonic on the first page, it look it looks like official art. I've taken the Spaziant pill. <laughs> <laughs> well, better the Spaziant pill than the Gallagher pill, because even though I oh, like yeah. this story, it still makes some really weird decisions uh, most notably that there's no little planet, which doesn't inherently bother me, but when they talk about Collision Chaos Zone, they call it an alternate dimension, and th- there's a stupid, like, Scott Fulop editor blurb that says, oh, they're the same type as the zones found in all Sonic games. That's not how zones work! It is in the yeah. comics, Devin. Live with it. <laughs> no, it's not in the comics either! It was only yeah. Gallagher who ever thought this. Even even in the scant moments where Penders takes a zone from the games, it's just a place. Well, I'm just saying this isn't the only time they do this. And maybe they change their mind later. It's usually but... Gallagher who does it. Well, maybe I'm more used to this era, but whatever. Yeah, because I thought yeah. the whole point of the different zones in this continuity, I guess, in the comics, is that they're... The zones are the alternate areas or whatever? Well, yes, but then then that makes sense for, for alternate universes, but this is just right. a, a place. It's just some right. part yeah. of the world. Oh, no, no, I, I get that, and, like, that that's that is dumb. Yeah, anyway, um, yeah, but Ro- Robotnik finds Amy uh, through through her letters to Sonic and, and kidnaps her, and he looks, like, delightfully, like, squishy and evil through this whole monologue he gives. 
squishy. That is a great description. Yeah, he's he's enjoying himself. I like um, I like how there's like a Jaws there, and he's like feeding it scrap metal. There's something always very funny to me when Robotnik has one of their own robots as like a little pet. Yeah, we hardly that, ever get to see appropriate Clark. for him. That's so appropriate for him. Yeah, totally. Um, also, you mentioned he seems very squishy. It's funny because uh, at some point they call him Flabio in this uh, in the story. And that's yeah. that's very appropriate. Yeah, so it's like it takes a while to actually get to the action, especially since we have like Snively in a fake Robotnik costume. And then we have like the Freedom Fighters with like a council meeting, which like they never do that before. Oh, um, I moved too, too far past. I have to bring up the fact that when Sonic initially sees uh, that Amy's been kidnapped, he has an interesting reaction line. He says, referring to Robotnik, why you snort, oily son of a woof. <laughs> you gotta I, censor that rage. I'm trying to imagine what that would sound like voice acted. Because, I mean, like a snort is just a... But a... a, a right. A woof? I don't, I don't know. Is he, is he barking? Is he going woof? You know, like... F I don't know. Ooh. He is spinning in the frame, so... Yeah. Yeah. I don't well, know. That's... Well... I, so yeah, oh, yeah I do Tails like... gets kidnapped too. That was my next comment. But I do have... like how they bring Amy into the story. I don't like how they bring Tails into the story because even the writers don't give him the respect he deserves. They just make him other hostage. What the heck? It doesn't. The worst part is that he he's immediately made another hostage. No, it takes like two seconds. That's that's yeah. sad. It's also it's also a shame because the the SWAT bots on that page are drawn really cool. They are. Oh yeah, art still top notch, of course. Yeah, um, I love the, I love the one that's holding up his tail's uh, left arm. I guess right for us. Um, that's just kind of looking down at him, disappointed. Like, come on, man, you were so easy to catch. Yeah, he's uh, he's annoyed that the writers had this too. <laughs> like, come on, you, you're better than this. Uh, well, so collision chaos is even more of a visual hodgepodge here than it is in CD. <laughs> like it just is it's just trip zone it's crazy yeah you definitely sell it as like an alternate dimension but they also have uh robotnik in the uh the sonic cd eggmobile with the but you can see that it's the same design and it's like wow it's so it's so different well actually it's not robotnik in there it's snively disguised as robotnik but it's so different when we have an artist that actually cares about the game's aesthetics hmm. <laughs> But we, we finally, after that, get to see Metal Sonic, Mecha Sonic, whatever you want to call him. And uh, he's, like, snarky and sarcastic. I really like how they integrate the holograms from the games by just randomly having Metal Sonic use a hologram to trick Sonic. Well, the, the two-page spread of them racing through Stardust Speedway is... that's quality. That is really cool. It also slightly breaks immersion because... Well, A, there's the giant Robotnik statue in the background that is very clearly of Sega's Robotnik and not uh, the Archie one. <laughs> and B... Uh, there's a Sega Saturn ad. Yeah. And also yeah. Espio in the, on the bottom left. It's not as clear here, but this will come back next episode, actually. I have a theory. So you're like, oh, these, are, these aren't zones, they're supposed to be locations or whatever. But no, no, these seriously are different realities. I think this is actually a window into the, like, game uh, version of Collision Chaos, which is uh -oh. why there's a Robotnik statue in the background. This will explain something else that will come up next episode. Oh, it, that's an interesting um, theory. Oh, but, the, but, but dude, the, start, the Stardust Speedway on the Sega CD version didn't have... Didn't have Sega Saturn ads in it, so it can't be the same one. That's obviously a joke. Um, I know. Uh, I, I, uh, yeah. Actually, there's a there's a vector poster as well on the uh, the start of the chapter four or whatever. Anyway, that yeah, it's it's funny though that it's like you know this artist knew about these characters and was drawing them into the comic before they were introduced. Um, and the final obstacle at the end of the track is the Crusher machine from the Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog credits. Yep, and uh, and Robotnik gets gotten by it, predictably. 
He also smashes another crab meat in there because he just does violence against his robots. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I gotta say, I, at first I like this because like, oh yeah, no, Robotnik's got a trap. He he he, sneaky him. And then um, Sally and Rotor get their own little side plot to stop him. But then like the gag at the end reveals that actually they didn't need to help at all. Sonic totally had it and could have sold this whole thing. Yeah, but Sally still gets to kick Robotnik in the back of the head, so... Well, you're right, that is pretty cool. That's always worth it. Yeah, oh, and Sonic also melts Metal Sonic by doing a, a figure-eight peel-out. Yeah, he just does... he just figures out how to do it. I guess, I guess this is the whole thing with his speed-proof sneakers, is that they can actually get so hot that they can burn things, but because Uncle Chuck made them right, they don't hurt Sonic. Well, no, I thought that um, Metal Sonic burned because he went too fast. Mm. Oh, you know what? You're right. I'm actually looking at it now. <laughs> yeah, he burns out his own engine. All right. Well, he deserved it. Um, and yeah, Robotnik gets gets crushed into the thing. There's a really weird moment where it has the reader's finger appear to point at Robotnik because you know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Another bit of uh, weird reader story interaction. So, yeah, no, Sonic CD, we get Amy finally. I, I like this final shot of them standing there, both because it looks cool and because I like the visual gag of Tails putting, like, ointment and band-aids on his back because he's been strapped to Amy and her quills have been digging into him. <laughs> oh, I didn't notice that. that. That's fun. Oh, poor Tails. I just realized Robotnik is even saying I hate that hedgehog a la Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog. Well, he did it in Sad AM too, but it's still yeah. fitting. Our final comic for today is another special, another 48-page special, the Sonic and Knuckles special. Uh, we get a nice cover from Spazion here with Sonic and Knuckles, uh, except for one weird thing, which is that we have this silhouette of Robotnik, but somehow his face and like the pattern on his suit are holes in the shadow. Let's just so you can see them. Um, it looks cool. Yeah. Yeah. I like the corner box is... I don't know the name of the badnik, but it's it's an enemy from Sonic and Knuckles. Yeah, the lumberjack guy. Yeah. You also get graffiti that says uh, Spinball and 32X on there. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of little details, aren't there? Which also, again, shows just how late this adaptation of a Genesis game is. Yeah. And it's it's still not to the, the final quote-unquote adaptation of Sonic & Knuckles there is, because we still aren't even at the Death Egg saga yet. There's no Death Egg in this Sonic & Knuckles adaptation. Mm. Well, so, uh, to be fair, this is like a very loose Sonic & Knuckles adaptation. Yeah, it's not especially uh, accurate. Yeah. Um, we're starting here with Panic in the Sky, written by Kantorovich and Penders, art by Mawini and a little bit of Monarch, I think. Yeah, a little bit. Um, when Angel Island suddenly begins moving through the sky and attacking with turrets, Sonic and Tails investigate, only to find Knuckles just as confused as they are. The three discover Robotnik is to blame as usual. As usual. So, when initially the Freedom Fighters are seeing this, they're like, huh, oh, some sort of floating, floating island, and then Sonic and Tails walk in, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we were at that place before. But they didn't mention it before, so that's funny. Yeah, they didn't... They didn't tell them about the adventure they went on we just went out for you know just get some air that's all you know for, for the memes we can also see penders tripping over his later continuity because sally doesn't know anything about knuckles but you know that's that's uh -oh. that's a later retcon so <laughs> um i i still don't like that they're talking about knuckles allegiance like it's some mystery like the guy was misled last time there's no there's no ambiguity here True. Yeah, so I get, yeah, I, I get the first time why they would go head to head, but when when Sonic and Knuckles go at each other in this one, like, it's totally needless, but this will be a trend, and I guess that's just the way the characters act in these comics. Yeah. Yeah, Knuckles is, I mean, uh, we're not quite there. Because, well, I mean, it's not even like there's, it really matters, like, what happens between them leaving and them finding Knuckles. They go to Mushroom Hill Zone, which has sentient mushrooms that try to eat them, which sounds oh, yeah, significant. I remember that from Sonic and Knuckles. <laughs> it sounds significant, but it really isn't. It just kind of happens, and then it's done with. 
Okay, in retrospect, I think this is actually a joke where Sonic gets hit by one of the pendulum things that you hang off of in Mushroom Hill Zone and then hallucinates the mushrooms being alive and trying to eat him. It's not explained very well. Also, I, I, so, a little, I, I'd like to question, how do the Freedom Fighters keep getting their hands on what is clearly military-grade equipment? Yeah, they're playing this issue appears to be like a World War II fighter? Uh, no, that's more like a, um... Like, either a cargo plane or, like, a propeller-driven bomber. It's a little too big to be a fighter. But it's clearly got U.S. Air Force uh, livery on it, so... They you just know keep... this stuff way better than me, so I'll take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it reminds... It, it, at least it gives me vibes of a um, bomber or a cargo plane. In any case, um... Yeah, we, I, I like that we have... We have mostly, like, Art Mawinney drawings for the first part of the issue, but then we have the reverse of the uh, the anti-Sonic story, where the moment the fight starts between Sonic and Knuckles, which they have no reason to fight each other, there's literally no reason for this to happen, but the moment it starts, it switches yep. to Dave Monarch's art, and it all looks janky. He doesn't know how to draw Knuckles as quills. Or he, just gets he just gets head tentacles. Yeah. <laughs> they eventually have to break up their fight because it's stupid and there's no reason for it to be happening, but it, you know, wasted a few pages, I guess. And Knuckles takes them through the Zoot Shoot, uh, which is one of the weirdest recurring gags in the series. <laughs> yep. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's the Chaos Chamber with the Chaos Emerald that holds up Angel Island, which isn't the Master Emerald, it's just a Chaos Emerald. It's still not the Master Emerald. Why not? You know, fucking... Yeah. Why well, now, not? Now it's continuity, so... Yeah. Yeah, uh, which is weird because I assume it gets retconned into being the Master Emerald. It's not. Well, I mean, it's it's a retcon in the context of its continuity that changes. There is an in-universe explanation, though. Okay, gotcha. I think yeah. You know, part of me was just thinking, um, it just happens. No, yeah, no, Bruce. It... Don't you worry. I mean, I don't know that you're worried about this. But <laughs> as the comics go on, they get more in line with the game continuity. And every little detail is meticulously explained, sometimes for really stupid reasons. But of course, there's always that's... explained. All right. Nice. That's, that's good, I guess. <laughs> I will say what's definitely inconsistent here is that Knuckles' decision when he learns that Eggman is siphoning power from the Emerald to control the island... Knuckles decides, oh, I'll just, uh, I'll just do a Sonic Adventure 2 and smash it. That's Except actually he... consistent. Uh, I was hoping that, you know, then you would get, like, a, a Knuckles miniseries, and he would go looking for the Emerald Shards. Well, that no. sounds like it would make sense. Instead, Except he just has another one. He just has another Emerald. <laughs> he pulls another one out of his ass. Well, uh, Not to be fair, yeah. uh... A few pages later, it's explained that it wasn't actually the real emerald that he shattered. It was just a fake. Why does he keep a fake around? You know, first, yeah, wait, yeah, why does he keep... Well, also, what was keeping the the island floating? Because you just crash. told me, Echidna boy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's all you need. I guess so. All right. I like anyway. when Robotnik is explaining their plan. Uh, to Knuckles and Sonic uh, and Tails that um, there's like a little diagram and one of them it, the, it, the Emerald Chamber has like a U label which means that he's actually showing the diagram to them not just to the readers that's the that's a robotic thing to do Sonic check yeah. off my mapping skills <laughs> which given that Angel Island is literally a continent I, I think that's a, a bit out of scale but whatever well, yeah, it, so he could work on that a little bit. No, I mean, the um, scale of Angel Island across the series is an absolute mess, so that's not even a comic-specific problem. That's true. true. Um, but yeah, overall, um, that not only is it like, how, what, Knuckles, how did you, what? But also, it's just totally an anticlimactic solution. Yeah, it makes the story feel like it has very little consequence. Like, the main... The main thing it needed to be to solve the main point of tension it felt like was when Knuckles was like about to like punch Sonic into a pool of lava. Like that was kind of 
really intense for no reason. Uh, and then the actual, I'm going to like, like Robotnik actually has this long speech where he's like, I will burn everything. And it shows like a Robotnik head over a blazing inferno. But it's like, but it doesn't really matter. It's... Yeah, it's solved it extremely quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the day is saved, I guess. And, you know, they're like, oh, what happened to Knuckles? Is he going to come back and join the Freedom Fighters? No. Uh, and uh, I like I like the last panel because, you know, they're like, oh, I think now and forever he's on his own. And they have this very epic looking uh, drawing of Knuckles that is very clearly Spaziant and not Monarch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, I I honestly it feels pointless. It feels like they would have better have just saved this for the Death Egg saga when they got there. Um Yeah. The literally yeah, the no, like just... I'm trying to think what unique things from Sonic and Knuckles are here that weren't in like the initial Sonic 3 adaptation. And it's like Mushroom Hill, yeah, uh, the woodcutter robot, and I guess lava means lava reef maybe. Yeah, a bit of a stretch, but sure. So, it's like, eh, it feels kind of obligatory. They just needed to... It's like they needed to get this out while Sonic and Knuckles was even still a relevant game, is what it is. Yeah. Uh, the story does feel kind of relevant, but in my opinion, not as irrelevant as the next story in this. Okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one who thought that was completely irrelevant. Fire Drill. Written, written and illustrated... By Ken Penders. Knuckles finds himself uh -oh. pursued by strange and dangerous events, and investigation into the mysterious cause leads him nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> this is the perfect summary. Well, leads like, him what the nowhere. What the heck do you say is going on? It's like there's just no. events happening at him. No, you're not wrong. It is basically fucking leads him nowhere. Also, I can I talk? Can I just mention how much I dislike the title "Sonic's Friendly Nemesis"? Yeah. First like of all, that. I would not call them nemesis. Nemesis is whatever. Um, and second of all, there's a word for that. It's called rival. Yeah. yeah. Well, and <laughs> and friendly rival is the language that Sega uses all the damn time. Yes. Uh huh. So. I, I, it just yeah. I I hate calling him the friendly nemesis because they're not nemesis. They they view they have more respect for each other than that. At least I, it's normally it's, it's the comics code for we're gonna have these guys fight a lot because it sells well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I I, I get that True. much, I guess, but it's just um, it's it's stupid um word. Well, in fairness, the rest of the story is also stupid. The story is literally pointless. No, will... you, you have to understand, the real point is to showcase the fantastic artistic talent of Ken Penders. I mean, okay, I will say this, it could be a lot worse. It is certainly not as bad as a lot of the stuff that people post from Penders. Right. Um, but he definitely doesn't know how to draw Knuckles gliding. He looks like he's like... Not an A pose and not a T pose, like an M pose. I will say, at least uh, the story does a little bit more to try to be an actual Sonic and Knuckles uh, issue bit, because yeah. it has Sandopolis in it. Yeah, yeah, we do get to explore the floating island a bit, um, but it's just incoherent in terms of plotting. No, yeah, n n no, no argument there. Yeah, the, the only uh, real it's it's just it's a story that's got no purpose but to be a hook for a different story. All you really know is that somebody is messing with Knuckles and they have hands. Wow. I am totally looking forward to the next part of this epic saga. Knuckles talks to himself for the whole story, which is also the the Penders trope that I mentioned in the Sally episode. Um <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of pages wasted on Knuckles not knowing anything. And the same can somewhat be said, slightly less, I guess, for the third story, Lord of the Floating Island, written by Penders again and art by 
Harvey Merca Ducasio, which I think is how you pronounce that name. That is a hell of a last name. Um, that is a is name we have not heard yet. Well, so he is an inker and has been for a lot of issues. Ah, um, uh, okay. I, I've been really been looking at the I've oh, the inkers. I've really just been looking at the uh, pencil work and the um, writers. Yeah, and that makes sense because the inking is one of those things where you don't really notice it unless it's egregiously bad. Yeah, it's hard for it to be really bad on digital versions. You'll see some. It's been it's just been okay yeah. up to this point. Um, I guess Harvo yeah. Harvo, as his nickname calls him uh, himself, as a penciler, is a little weird. I'm guessing they just could not get anyone else for this. It's possible. Um, oh, I didn't read the summary. Angel Island That's is hit funny. by an eclipse, and Knuckles comforts a young kangaroo who doesn't understand. I <laughs> very so, very basic summaries. Is it is it just me that thinks it's weird to see Knuckles tougher than leather, the echidna being good with kids? It's weird, but it's kind of wholesome. Mm, yeah, um, but it, it's like it just. It brings in fact. It brings into question the um, the designs. Like this kangaroo is like somewhere between standard Sonic character design and actual fucking animal. Yeah, it, it looks weird, and I I think the thing that that Lauren's getting at is that I don't know if this is really in character for Knuckles. Um, no, it, it isn't really in character. Well, if it, what it is is that we're not used to seeing Angel Island populated, but both the yeah. games and the comic need to, in different ways, address the idea of Knuckles being alone, but he's not alone at all. Yeah, it, it more and more inhabitants start to pop up in Angel Island, which makes it more strange that Knuckles is still a lot of the uh, things he is in the games, that being, uh, you know, naive, easily tricked. Uh, distrustful, that sort of thing, when he's around so many people. Yeah, like, I'm trying to think, in, in the games, the only evidence that I ever remember seeing that Angel Island was populated besides Knuckles is that Ice Cap in Sonic Adventure has some houses in it. Oh, yeah. Whereas this, you got kangaroos, you've got these weird dingo guys who, like, stampede through the forest, which is... Extremely weird when you know that in, like, a uh, half a year, uh, Penders is going to write these guys to be some sort of weird, like, military men. Oh. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I, oh. I don't know. It's it's just strange. And, <laughs> you know, it's like we have, we have a few pages of weird events, and then Knuckles just waits to the eclipse and says, I protect and serve, and that's the end. Go, oh, Knuckles, he's the best. You know, it's funny, uh, because I don't know if I've mentioned on this podcast, I love Knuckles, he's a great character. Oh, Knuckles is, is, is really, fun. He's rough in the comics. I don't know that I can like him consistently. So, in these. it does feel like that, um, I, I think part of my what, I, my, what I've come to uh, enjoy about Knuckles and Tails comes from the second Sonic movie, because they were both very well done in those. So, I, I think part that's part of that. But, um, they are, I, I like, I, I do like Knuckles. But, yeah, so far in the comics, we've seen him, what, twice now? Three times, maybe? Three times? I don't know. We've seen him. That's the problem. He's so, every time he's shown up, it's been so unmemorable. We don't remember how many yeah. times we've seen him. True. So part of it is that it's hard to get a handle on the character's personality if you're writing this in 1995 or 96 or whenever. But I think that in that, you should have still come out with a consistent and distinctive vision, which it doesn't feel like they did. Knuckles just sort of... It, like, I'm trying to think, what is his personality? And I don't think the fact that he never shuts the hell up is meant to be a personality trait, because that's just how Penders writes. He just writes extremely verbose dialogue. Um, and so, like, Knuckles' main per personality trait is that he wants to protect Angel Island. But that's not really a character trait. No. Um, so, I, I, it feels like... I think part of the problem is they're trying to push Knuckles as a character... But the pro but we've seen him so few times that like, well there's not much to go off of there. No, yeah, they're trying to build it up all at once. 
had them really building, close together. Right. It sh they should be showing him more if they really wanted him to, to be more of a character. Yeah. Well, I promise you we're going to get to see more Knuckles, so... Uh, maybe well, maybe it'll get better. Old. Maybe it'll get worse. Who knows? Or maybe it'll get weird. Oh, I guarantee it'll get weird. It's already getting weird. Uh, oh, boy. But that is it for this special. Um, How does it rank against Sonic in your face? I'd say that that one was better. Oh, yeah, easily, easily. So. easily. Definitely. All right. Well, next time on Deep Dive Zone, we are going to be looking at Sonic number 26, 27, 28... And in between those, we're also going to be looking at the Sonic Triple Trouble special, which means we've already got more Knuckles confirmed, because he's in that game. That is true, he is. Yeah. He is a game. Thank you all so much for watching. If you liked or enjoyed, feel free to share, comment, or subscribe. And if you'd like to contact us, you can reach us at deepdivezonepod at gmail.com or at deepdivezone on Twitter. Have a great night, and we will see you next week.